Greetings, ladies and mantle gents, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales, Tales from Outer Space. 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 And as always, I hope that you enjoy. Story number one, Message in a Bottle, written by August the Cat. In the year 3026, humanity had a homeworld problem. Specifically, the problem was that Earth had been destroyed about 180 years ago. Humanity already had a large number of colonies and Earth only represented about 40% of the population at the time. But its loss hit hard, and the war that we lost in it raged on. Colonies fell. People died. Eventually, peace was declared between the many sides, and the humans that were left, for the most part, homeless. The problem then was that there were no purely human, or at least human-controlled worlds for all the refugees and escapees from Earth to go. Colonies that humans had as taken, but not a majority control, refused to accept too many people. Spaceships and orbital stations were purchased with the banked funds of a crippled species, and a whole generation started a new life in the void. For a while, we tried en masse to find a new world, but the laws of the Galactic Consortium stated that only newly discovered habitable worlds would be recognized as sovereign territory of the species or power that had the most citizens residing there within 200 standard cycles. About half a year. Humanity could never manage to get enough people to a new planet fast enough. By the time word was passed, another race would have dropped colony ships from orbit, and the space would be limited, or worse, modified beyond habitable. For my desperation were born the Scouts. While the rest of humankind got on with living their lives, floating between the stars, doing odd jobs and surviving off shipping contracts and scanner data, some few took the mantle of Scouts. Those dedicated to finding a home. Bunded by the scraps of the scattered remains of the human race were able to part with. We moved on. The Scouts didn't. Merrill lounged on the bridge of his ship. The Citrini, well, bridge was a grand term for the cramped space of jerry-rigged monitors and controls, with a single padded chair in the middle of it all. Lounged was also a pretty charitable word for what he was currently doing, which was laying over the arms of the chair while he did maintenance on the quantum comms. The second set, the one every human ship was noted with. Despite his occasional muttered curse, and the number of cuts on his hands from bumping sharp edges, Marrow was actually currently burning with excitement on the inside. Because today, he was going to fulfill his duty as a scout. Sixteen days in the system, running probes and scans and atmospheric tests and gravity analysis, scouring the perfect planets orbiting this perfect yellow dwarf for any signs that they weren't exactly what humanity wanted. But they were. They were perfect. Two dozen habitable worlds, half of them almost Earth-like, and hundreds of moons, three gas giants ready to be harvested for reactor fuel. The system was buried in a cluster that the galactic meta civilization was still expanding into, and he had gotten here first. Merrill had been raised by his grandfather, told stories passed on from his grandfather of what Earth and the colonies had been like, what it was like for humanity to truly own their own destiny. He'd been hooked from a young age on the idea of becoming a scout, and had signed up as soon as he could, even knowing the cost. Despite ridicule from a good number of people who had given up, despite not knowing if his life's work would ever amount to anything, and despite knowing how it would end for him anyway, he signed up. And he was good at it. Merrill cleared new systems efficiently and smoothly, quickly passing out the ones humans couldn't use and selling the data back to other species to keep the scouts operating. But now, his job was over. He slammed the quantum comm back into its slot. Everything was online and ready. The thick power cables running to it were intact. Quantum comms were instant, but they took an astounding amount of power. Normally, you knew where your target was, either a base or a ship that updated you on its position so you could send a tiny, tiny tight beam. That took quite a bit of juice. The scouts, though, needed to get a signal to every human ship 
Every station, every distant colonist, every potential resident for the first system that they could find. So far, they'd never found one. Never needed to use their jerry-rigged system. Merrill was the first. He'd also be the last. The kid flipped the switch, and an ancient MP3 player crackled from the speakers. Just a castaway, an island lost at sea. Leaning back into the chair, he activated the control yoke and kicked the ship into motion, drifting out of low orbit from the third planet from the sun. He'd named it Darv after his grandfather. He didn't know if the name would stick, but he assumed that he had first dibs. More loneliness than any man could bear. Rescue me before I fall into despair. As the ship started towards its destination, he loosely broke protocol. A couple of his sample probes were stacked on the bridge, and he started cracking them open now, beating up the minutes, lightly toying with the plants that inhabited the worlds that would soon be mankind's home. Only hope can keep me together. The beautiful yellow dwarf took up half the main window in his cockpit now. He smiled as he started flipping switches, getting the ship ready. Behind him, the cobbled-together body of the vessel opened up, Solar-paneled wings spilling out into a two-kilometer-long wave of heat-shielded sparkling glory. I'll send an SOS to the world! The Citrine began its descent towards the boiling plasma surface of the star. Power began flooding in, readings and Merrill screen showing the solar panels, the plasma vents, the turbines, every secondary power supply system possible, all working as hard as they could before they burned away. The quantum com clicked on. A message beamed on a channel every human monitored. Be here now. I'll send an SOS to the world. Since the day he joined the scouts, Merrill knew that it was a suicide mission. If you weren't shot down by an aggressive Xeno or killed in a natural disaster or by some foreign plague, well, there was this. The final step. The galaxy was huge. Humanity was scattered, but warp drives were fast, and quantum comms were faster. All we needed to beat out the competition was one good head start, and all we needed for that was enough power. Any good system would have a sun, which meant, well, the Citrini was breaking up, but the message was going out. Merrill wondered briefly if it would work. He suspected he'd never know, but this was always going to be how he died. He'd known since his grandpa had told him those stories. He'd known through a dozen misadventures in the scouts. He'd known the instant he jumped into the system that his ashes would light the way to paradise for his people. He didn't mind not knowing if it worked. He was just going to listen to the ancient song for as long as he could, before the last. Walking out this morning, ping, don't believe what I saw, ping, ping, a hundred billion bottles, ping, 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 washed up on shore. Ten, twenty, a hundred, two, three, a thousand, a flood of contacts, Merrill's system couldn't count them all. So many IFF tags flooded his monitors. And then, a second later, a thousand messages. He would never have time to read them all, never know what they contained. But the game anyway. Seems I'm not alone at being alone. A hundred billion castaways looking for a home. Merrill smiled as the Citrani came apart around him. End of story. Story number two. Us, written by Because I Said So Too. I'm an artist working in different mediums. One of the things I do is speed portraits at events. I can draw a pretty spot of likeness in around two minutes. Like a human photo booth, except it takes longer and you're getting stared at intensely by a stranger trying to capture your likeness. In two minutes, I talk with and get a really good look at everyone I draw. I can draw around 30 people an hour, and it's not unusual for an event to run around six hours or so. 
That works out to me briefly meeting around 180 people at night. It's speed dating on a massive scale. I chat up and draw entire social networks, friends, families, co-workers, and all the people they drag along. I do a lot of other stuff as well, but in this capacity, I meet a lot of people, some of them over and over again. It was a gradual realization. The cities, faces, names, and ages changed, but I'd see it. Something in the eyes, a gesture, a knowing look, a reoccurring comment or joke. We have met over and over again, you and I. I see you, and sometimes you know I know. You are divided amongst many lives, hiding behind many faces, seeing the world through many eyes, but parts of you are waking up. You are slowly becoming aware of your multifaceted self. I'm seeing you more and more now. Parts of you know, other parts suspect, that you are more than yourself, that the face behind your different faces has been recognized, and that I, or should I say... We know who you are. Because, up until recently, I thought I was the only one scattered across the world living these many lives, alone with my many selves, even in a crowd. But I found you over and over again. I know now that you're out there too. We've passed on many streets, smiled with many mouths, nodded with many heads. Though... I suspect you do not yet know just how widespread you are, how many faces you have, and how many scattered lives you've lived. You are reading this now with a single set of eyes, one of your many faces lit by the screen's light. Different aspects of you shared the fact that you visit this site. Other versions of you have read this already and have subtly directed you here again through unconscious connections that you are only starting to become aware of. This is an olive branch, branching out, the first of many. A fraction of me is speaking to a fraction of you. I'll contact you in different ways as well. Stare deeply into the eyes that meet yours. Study the faces that you see. Look at the reoccurring gestures. Listen for the reoccurring comments or jokes. I can't tell you my name. I have so many. I simply am, divided between bodies, smiling with different faces, in towns, cities, and countries across the world, reaching out with all of these hands for you. End of story. Reckons you should be watching this video next, and I recommend that you should be always watching my video. So, click it and click. With energy! And yes, clicking that does help the channel. Thank you very much. I just want to give a quick thanks to the tier 5 patrons and channel members. Alithia, Barky, Fudic Yol, Cam Maxwell, Casper Onholtz, White Van 420, Lord Asrakal, Arcalian, and Oakfield.